folks. Just a great time to uh, gather during the midweek. Always a good time. Praise the Lord. We're going to be studying through Isaiah chapter 56 tonight. Isaiah chapter 56. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 56. Just a quick announcement, guys. Uh, the River of Life Mission. Uh, we're going to be serving there on Tuesday, September the 26th. I know that it's just a few weeks away, but a slot opened up and we jumped right on it. And uh, praise the Lord, guys. It's always a blessing to be able to serve out at the mission. So Tuesday, September the 26th, the last, I believe that's the last Tuesday of the month. But again, uh, put a mental note and we'll be... Uh, having that in our announcements on Sunday morning, but I wanted to just get a little bit of a head start uh, uh, on that mission so we can plan accordingly. But Isaiah 56, guys, uh, subtitled in my Bible, one of my Bibles has been uh, Rewards for Obedience to God, Rewards for Obedience to God. And as this subtitle infers, guys, it's an encouragement for all the people of God uh, on good living, or even better yet, not good living, but godly living, godly living. It's an encouragement, again, that obedience to God uh, brings the blessings of God, you know, rewards for the obedience of God, and again, it's an encouragement for us that we might be uh, those uh, accustomed and walking and living in godly, uh, a godly lifestyle. It's a call to put into practice the ethics and the morals to encourage holy living. And you know, we live in a, a society where we think that, hey, what, what ethics? People don't have ethics today. People don't have much moral. And above all, you know, there's not much holy living. And you know, God is the one really uh, putting that call on his people. And he's really speaking to the nation of Israel. But much of it, so, you know, tr just trickles right down to the body of grace, guys. All of this should have good effects on us to the influence on how we live today in this world and how we relate to people, how we live in this world, how we act in this world. People, uh, Peter wrote in his first epistle, his first letter, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely at the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and Peter says it rightly, he says, prepare your minds, guys. And you know, a lot of times the mind is such a fertile place for warfare. The mind is where we can get discouraged. The mind is where we can just drift away. The mind is where we can get carried away in anger or sadness or bitterness or despondency, whatever it might be. But he says, prepare your minds and keep sober in spirit. He doesn't say be filled with the spirits or, or the spirits of alcohol, but he says, you know, keep a sober in spirit. In other words, keep our spirit, the spirit that dwells within us. Be sober minded and, 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 and remember uh, who we are in Christ and what he's done for us and, and what we are. Uh, what we do in, in that lifestyle and walking with him and living for him. He says, fix your hope completely at the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peter expected that the coming of the Lord would be soon. As we should, as we look towards the signs of the times in the world, we can say that, wow, we've never been closer than we are right now to the coming of the Lord. So he says, set your hope completely at the grace to be brought to you. And you know, hope is always that anticipation of good things to come. And, uh, and it seems that there's grace upon grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Guys, we think that we are recipients of grace now, but God is going to pour out even a greater abundance of grace upon us at that revelation of Jesus Christ. And as then, so it, as it should be today, guys, a call for obedience to God. Why don't we pray? Father God, we do want to thank you, Lord. What a great title this uh, Isaiah 56 is entitled, uh, uh, rewards for obedience to God, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that you might again stir us on uh, to the things that cause godly living, Lord, that we might, might be a people putting into practice the ethics we have uh, in your word and in, in, uh, uh, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, Father. And a call to higher morals, Lord. The, the morals of this world, they're really loose, they're really low, and you know, some of them have thrown the book of morals right out the window. But we, we know that you seek truly to encourage us to holy living, Father God, and, uh, uh, and how we live and how we relate to this world, Father. We look to you, Lord, uh, 
uh, preparing, you helping us prepare our minds for action, Lord, you keeping us sober in spirit, our hope being fixed in, at, at you, on you, Lord, uh, at the grace to be brought to you, at the revealing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, again, we thank you for this evening. Bless us as we continue through the study of your word now. Father, we uh, pray, Father God, for all the cleanup efforts uh, in Houston and Louisiana, Lord, the aftermath of Harvey, Lord, and all the things of the water, standing water, and mosquitoes, Lord, and pestilence, and uh, 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 even uh, uh, the life-threatening diseases that might be beginning, Lord, to us to wrap up. Father, we do pray, Lord, for those uh, with all their homes, uh, destroyed, Lord, and no place to go, Father, that uh, you might be uh, their hope in the middle of things, and that you might use your body, Lord, there to, uh, again, reach out and to minister, Father. And we join in with those, the body of Christ, Lord, as we come together in prayer, Lord, just asking for your help and your resolution, Lord, and that many might come to that place of calling out to you, Father, during this time. We pray for those in the Caribbean islands, or the Bahamas, who are being hit by this new uh, Category 5 uh, uh, hurricane, Lord, that just seems to uh, have de devastating winds, Lord. And uh, we do pray for your grace and mercy upon the people of those islands, Lord. And even as the storm races toward uh, Florida, Father, we pray, Lord, for the, those Floridians, Lord. And uh, we pray, Lord, for selfishly for Kennedy and his family, Lord. They're just newcomers to the state of Florida, Lord, and uh, uh, a lot of things going before them, Lord. We pray your grace and mercy for their lives, Lord. And we thank you ahead of time for, again, what you're doing here in our midst tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Ver uh, verse 1 of chapter 56, Thus says the Lord, Preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. The Lord calls out to, pre to preserve righteousness, guys, in all areas of life. He calls this out to the children of Israel, and again, it speaks right to the, our hearts also. He says, and justice is, uh, this word justice is closely related to righteousness, guys, and then as it is now, the, the court systems fail, and you, you know, you kind of think of yeah, our own court system, it sounds so appropriate for the day. The wicked were falsely justified, the poor were were robbed of justice because of legal wranglings, false charges, and so forth. And you know, that's how it is in our society today. If you wrong, you right. And you know, this is this is the horrible thing. The greatest travesty of justice is all these guys in their uh, legal wranglings and their maneuverings, how they try and st uh, stymie those who are trying to do right. Yet the psalmist wrote, he says, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and the needy. And you know, in, in, in many of the cases, they make a good cry for this and that, for the poor and the needy, but I really think that uh, they're really self-serving. They try to get their own agenda uh, through, and, and it, it's not really trickling down uh, to where it ought to be. But so often, justice seems so far away and I think that, you know, that really uh, speaks of our times, that uh, justice seems so far away. And, um, you know, it's almost hopeless at times as we look at our own legal system. But the word righteousness here, guys, paints a picture of a sense of loyalty demonstrated by a king or a priest as a servant to his God. When you can kind of think that a king or a priest uh, and, and his uh, attitude as he is, he is a servant to his God, you can kind of think that, hey, Jesus Christ, he was not only a king, he was not only a priest, but he was a servant before God the Father, guys. And here we kind of think that Jesus is the greatest example as it is, but here the word righteousness paints a picture of a sense of loyalty demonstrated uh, uh, by a servant to his God. Take it a step further, and again, it speaks of our own loyalty to our God, guys. The word righteousness may speak of all that God expects from his people. It speaks of practical ways we might implement into our own lives and relationship with God on this idea, guys. God is, God is righteous, and, and it, his righteousness really speaks of an expectation 
of his people and surely it did for the children of Israel and surely we as Christians today are called to a higher standard of living. We are called to a higher level of accountability for what we know and who we are and the God that we serve and how much more we know that uh, than the worldlings who are out there worshiping and falling down before their own false gods. There is a thought of honesty and fair offer as we come before the Lord, as we deal with righteousness uh, before the, the true and the living God, before our holy God. And, and, and why do we preserve justice and do righteousness, guys? Because His salvation is about to come. And we live in this expectancy that the coming of the Lord could be at any moment, guys. And, and, and we live in this way that we want to pres per, uh, preserve justice and we want to live righteously in this world because his salvation is about to appear. Salvation speaks of his deeds of deliverance, guys. His help, his prosperity and salvation, his saving and the victory and security um, we have in him, guys. And you know, you know, a lot of these words are right out of the Vines uh, uh, dictionary. You know, it's not only a Greek dictionary, but Vines has a, a limited amount of of Hebrew translations. And when you think of this word salvation, this is how he describes it. W.E. Vine uh, sp speaks of his deeds of deliverance, his hope, his prosperity, and his salvation for his people. You know, his saving grace for our lives. His righteousness is to be revealed. And you might think of this as truthfulness, as demonstration of his mercy towards his people. And then, you know, yet while we were yet far away, Christ demonstrated his mercy for us that while we were, yet, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His righteousness speaks of his victory and our deliverance in him from death and from destruction and from separation from the true and the living God. Verse 2 says, How blessed is the man who does this, and the Son of Man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath. How blessed is the man who does this. I kind of zoom in on that. Blessed or happy does infer a state of prosperity or happiness. But at times, while one might be being corrected, like Job, in Job chapter 5, in his, all his, dis, uh, his difficulties, he's, he may be described as a happy or blessed in the outcome. Not in his present state, but the outcome would be good in Christ Jesus. As, as hard as Job had it, as much as he was going through times of the loss of his family, the loss of his wealth, the loss of his health, the loss of uh, his friends and respect of his friends and even the respect of his wife. Uh, uh, he was described as happy or blessed in that the outcome would be good in God. You know, and at times it's the hardest things to, uh, for us to think that even as Job went through this, this, this difficult time, he was blessed in the fact that he kind of knew that if the outcome would be good, God would have the victory. And sometimes we think, God, where are you when it hurts? God, where are you when all this injustice is going on? Yet we can just say, hey God, hey God we, we are happy, we are blessed, knowing that the outcome would be good in Christ Jesus for we who are Christians. The Sabbaths uh, that are mentioned here and in verse five, 4 and I believe verse 6 speaks of a day of gladness, a delight, a holy day of the Lord. It spoke of self-denial and a rejection of natural desires. It, what, what is that? That's the hardest thing to do, yeah, because we love to fulfill our own desires. We like to, oh, that cheesecake, oh, that's so good, oh, that donut, oh, I think I'll, have, I'll, I'll give in, I'll have a second donut. Whatever it might be, good. But the Sabbath mentioned uh, this, it speaks of self-denial or a rejection of natural desires. And you know, we can, we can joke about donuts and stuff like that. But the natural desires are the, really the desires that go against the grain of God. They really go against what you know, He desires, what His Word says, what He declares. They might be going after other relationships. They might be going after un unsavory business deals. It might speak of hey, the natural desires is, yeah, I want to go out and, and fill that bowl and smoke that pipe and, you know, have that drink or that six pack, whatever it might be. But it speaks of a self-denial and rejection of natural desires and honoring of the Lord, a time of dedication to the Lord and giving the Old Testament saying time to engage in spiritual exercise and strengthening of the spiritual life. 
See, you know, we don't, we don't uh, practice the Sabbath. We practice the first day of the Lord, which is Sunday. We gather together to worship the Lord. We gather uh, to, uh, together to, again, celebrate the great things of God. But as the Sabbath was celebrated back on Saturdays in the Old Testament times, it was really a time, again, of saying, Hey, Lord, I want to put you first. I want to deny the desires of my flesh. I want to reject those things, that those natural tendencies I have. And again, set a tone of dedication to the Lord in giving, uh, uh, giving my time to engage in spiritual exercise and strengthening of the spiritual life. It was kind of a rigid type of thing. But you know, God, God knew that man kind of needed the law to kind of chase him towards him. And, and, and yet, you know, we know that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. And, you know, he's again filled us with his grace and his love. Verses 3 to 5 says, And let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of the sons and daughters. I will give to them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. See, here, here's the guys. Uh, the Lord is so gracious, guys. Here, even in these verses, are included all those outside of the nation of Israel. Remember that Israel was God's chosen people. That if you weren't a Jew, it's like hey, you were outside of the promises of God that he had for his, uh, for his people. But included... Uh, uh, but God opens it up to all people, guys. His promise of salvation and hope everlasting. He opens it up to all the nations. For the eunuchs, uh, uh, the goyim were thought of less than human. The goyim were the, uh, the heathen, the nations, those who were of the Jewish faith, guys. The goyim were thought of less than human by the Jews and excluded from the blessings and the benefits afforded to God's people. If you were a goyim, if you were a Greek, you were, you were a barbarian, you know, you, you were less than human. Also, the eunuchs were those who were physically imperfect, guys. They were physically imperfect, but neither would these be excluded from the grace of God. The, the eunuchs being physically imperfect guys, and I kind of, you know, was meditating on that, and, and sometimes we might think that we're physically imperfect, but more so we we spiritually imperfect. We were, we were blighted with this thing called sin, and we were far from perfection, guys, because we were marked with all the sin of the world, all the sin of separation that, la that was upon us, guys. And in that, uh, we become those spiritual eunuchs, uh, uh, imperfect before the Lord, and He chose what pleases uh, what pleases me, and uh, the the word cho choose or choice. God all along has given man the ability to choose. He says, "Hey, uh, uh, we we can choose the the choices laid before us, life or going on in our own way." We can say, hey, I never gonna quit this. I never gonna do this because you know that's how it is. But God has given the, us this ability to choose. We can say, hey God, I need your help in this manner. God, I need your help in this area. God, you know, I surrender my desire for this. I surrender my natural desire. I I, I want to reject these things. And God, help me to make this choice. And we can choose the choices laid before us, life or going our own way. As simple as it sounds, these little uh, uh, wristbands that, the, the, that, that had WWJD initialized on itself. Remember those bands? It said WWJD on the wristband. And as, as, as hokey or simple you think that might be, what would Jesus do was the question uh, raising the hearts and minds of the wearer of these bands. And you can kind of think that I don't need that band, but hey, when I come to make a choice, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would please him? What would glorify him? What would edify and encourage others? Do we want to be a stumbling block to those around us? Or do we want to help build those younger Christians, those most more sensitive Christians? What would glorify him? Or what is ple or, or what is pleasing to me? Oh, it, 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 it makes me feel good, so I do it. 
or what is pleasing to me, what makes me feel good or important or as smart or as wise as the Lord that I don't have to consult Him. You know, sometimes we just go, we just kind of just cavalierly sin because we won't ask the Lord. And sometimes that's a couple, sometimes people will say, let me pray about it. They're really telling you, hey, don't talk to me about it because my mind is already made up. But others are sincerely saying, hey, can you pray for me about this? Or I, I want to pray for this. You know, I'm praying for this. Can you pray along with me? You know, that, that God would really help me through this or God would really reveal his mind. What? WWJD, what would Jesus do? And sometimes we know the answer, but sometimes we reject the answer that we reject the answer. Verses 4b says, hold fast to my covenant. And the primary root for this word hold or to hold fast is to be or to grow firm or strong or strengthened. I love that term, hold fast. It's kind of like a term that you see in the book of Hebrews where, uh, where the commandment is stand fast or hold fast. And it's the same idea, guys, to strengthen or to be courageous that word hold fast is hey, in the Lord we can become powerful. In the Lord we can be caught fast. It's kind of like a, a hooky man. The hook is set. We caught in the things of the Lord. We standing fast in Him. It's kind of like we're running away in the current. We drop that anchor and we, we caught fast. We're holding fast upon the rock of Jesus Christ, guys. Hold fast also means to be collected, to collect strength or collected strength, to be encouraged. To be established uh, securely, to be fortified. I love this one. This is the best one out of my uh, New American Standard Concordance. It says gain ascendancy. And I, I had to look up that word in my handy Webster's Dictionary. The word ascendancy speaks of a position of A position of certainty or domination, guys. Gain ascendancy says we gain the position of domination. In other words, the things that once dominated our lives, the sin that once dominated our lives, we have gained ascendancy or we have taken a higher position than that which once held our lives. We have overcome. We have prevailed in those things. We have recovered. Ooh, that's a good word. Yeah, we've recovered from those things. We have, uh, we are strongly supported. Who we strongly supported by, guys, is God, the Holy Spirit, that strongly supports us as we hold fast to the covenant. Hold fast to my covenant. God's covenant with us is agreement for us. Verse 5 says, to them, to them I will give them in my house, within my walls, a memorial. Who is them, guys? Those outside of the house of Israel, those who are imperfect, hey, those who are outside of the blessings of God, Within this house, within the walls, he gives us an everlasting name. Isn't that great, guys? Isn't that wonderful? At times, we may feel so forgettable. Don't you have people tell you, oh, oh yeah, you look so familiar. I say, oh, yeah, common face. I actually get wise. I tell them, oh, yeah, handsome face. Yeah, the guy must be handsome. <laughs> but sometimes we feel so forgettable. We feel so insignificant. People don't or they won't care. They won't remember, but the Lord does. And we are precious in His sight, guys. God, God never forgets one, each one of us. We think that we're so insignificant, so manini, so minute, so puny, that nobody cares, but God cares. God loves us. He cares for us, guys. We are precious in His sight, and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Oh, isn't that so great? He knows every one of us, man. He knows every hair on our head, if you have hair, guys. <laughs> oh, he knows every part of your scalp. Sorry. We got two bald heads over here. <laughs> but verse 6, he says, again, the term Sabbath is again mentioned here in verse 6. It's again interesting that the Lord would come in on the Sabbath. In Mark 2.27, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. In other words, the Sabbath was made for man's benefit, not for God's. It wasn't for, 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 for a man to come and, and benefit God and bless God by observing the Sabbath. But the Sabbath was, should have been a blessing for the people. The Sabbath was made for man and not for God. The Sabbath 
of rest would say that men, men would be the receiver of God's blessing, of God's rest. All of the rest and all the blessing uh, of simply focusing on God's goodness, guys, His love for them, and His de desire to be a blessing. And I think that in that, guys, we always in this place of Sabbath, or the Lord would always desire that we would be in a place of rest before Him. We would be in a place of just saying, hey Lord, I want to stand under the spout. I want to receive all the fullness of spiritual blessing. And I want to simply focus on all your goodness, Lord. Isn't, isn't that so great? Isn't that what it is? Our worship, our communion with Him, His love for them, His desire to be a blessing. And you know, God would desire that hey, we would know that uh, uh, He's a blessing to us and, and we're a blessing to Him. I, I wasn't designed... It, I wasn't designed for men to give up or give unto God. It wasn't designed for man to give up or give unto God begrudgingly or unwillingly to spend time in communion and fellowship with Him. See, it became a drag for the guys. It became, it's saying that, hey, we cannot observe the Sabbath. We gotta keep the gates of the wall of the city open because we need to make merchandise. We need all this to come in. We need to be doing things. We need to be making money. We need to be not resting before God or, or shutting the business down or anything like that. But it became a begrudging thing. It became, man's heart became unwilling to spend time in communion and fellowship with him. It was a, so uh, it was supposedly to be a blessing, yet in man's mind, it was a chore. And what, what a sad statement that is, uh, what's a chore to worship in God? It's a chore to be obedient. It's a chore to receive all the blessing that you have. Yet in man's mind, uh, uh, it was a chore, don't you know, I got better things to do. Or, wow, isn't that shocking? I have better things to do. I can be resting, I can be doing this, I can be doing that. But it wasn't designed for man to give up or give unto God. It was designed that God would just pour out the blessing. And you know, it's still designed for that, that we would rest in the Lord. We don't have to call it Sabbath like some of the Seventh-day Adventists, they still observe the Sabbath, I believe. But, you know, every day we, we kind of in this Sabbath rest with the Lord. Verse 7 says that, Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. And, you know, this is why Jesus was so mad. You know, when he up, turned upside down the tables of the money changers, they were there, they were there in the court of the Gentiles. They were taking up all the space, making all their merchandise, collecting all their money. And he says, hey, you've turned my father's house from a house of prayer to a robber's den. And, and, and why do we always call out for people to come and join in prayer? This is God's house, guys. And yes, we're the temple of the living God. And we can always pray 24-7. We can be praying to our, our Lord. Uh, aloud or in our hearts, whatever it might be, watching this is driving down, down the road in your car or your bus. Don't close your eyes when you're praying, if you're driving. But you know, as we come into God's house, it's a place for people to come out corporately gathering in prayer, guys. And there's power in that. There's power as God's people come out to worship Him. There's an even greater uh, intensity and measure of spiritual blessing, guys, for those who pray. And he, he says it right here, my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Verse 8 says, the Lord who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. God is not done gathering him, him uh, to himself those of the household of Israel and those outside of the household of Israel, guys. God is still doing a great work. God is still doing a great work in the Middle East. God is doing a great work in uh, in Japan. I, I, I got to speak to Pastor Santo uh, just very briefly uh, at the, up at Komomai a few weeks ago. And, and in his estimation, the church is making good headway. In his estimation, you know, uh, Maybe in, our, in my Western thought, I, th I think it's not enough, it's not fast enough, not enough people are getting saved. But he says, hey, you know, he's been laboring 25, 20, 25 years in Tokyo, and he's seen, you know, the steady progress of the Lord. And, 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 and it's kind of like, hey, Russell, Kuya Jets, God is good, God is working. You know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm saved now because, you know, I feel this, this uh, compassion for these people who worship all these other gods. 
and, and they don't know the true of the living God. But God is not done. He's gathering to himself, guys, of uh, uh, building up this big household of Jesus Christ. Guys, verse 9 says, All you beasts of the field, all you beasts of the forest, come and eat. And this term beast here is not used in any good sense, guys. Beast is more like a dumb animal, or even worse, like the beast as described in Revelation 13, verses 1 to 4. Who is like the beast, the people says? Who is like the beast who is able to wage, who is able to wage war with him? Hey, they thought that he was the best thing since hot buttered bread, man. They said, hey, this guy is the cat's meow. Who is this beast that came out of the sea? Who is this beast, you know? They, they use this term for the Antichrist time and time again. In four verses, they use it at least four times. As they say, who is able, who is like the beast, who is able to wage war against him? Hey, he's like God, man. Nobody can go up against the beast. And this is what the world is saying. This is what the world is saying, hey, He's the guy, man. He's the man. He's the man. But verse 10 says that all you watchmen are blind. All of you know nothing. All of you are like dumb dogs, unable to bark. Dreamers lying down who love to slumber. And you know, there, there are those who love to slumber. There are those dumb dogs, unable to bark. And you know, dogs is always a derogatory statement for these, you know, like these temple prostitutes these male prostitutes and stuff like that. But God's watchman, uh, and he sees the sword coming upon the land, and he blows the trumpet and warns the people. You know, the, the, good, uh, the good watchmen are the ones crying out, hey, the Lord is coming, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Ezekiel says again, he sees the sword coming upon the land, he blows the trumpet and he warns the people. We become as those watchmen on the wall, guys. We, uh, we are the ones heralding the coming of the Lord. And God is coming. Look at the signs of the time. God is shaking up the world. Look at the signs of the time. God is do doing a wake-up call, saying, Hey, wake up, all you sleepyheads. Wake up, all you dumb dogs, unable to even bark. Because that's how the world is. You, they, they're just so dumb. Oh, we're just boring. We'll have a fundraiser. We'll, we'll get Bruno Mars. We'll put him on TV and we'll raise some funds and blah, blah, blah. But you know, these guys are just, they're just lying down. They're just dreaming and they love to just slumber. And I think they're thinking about this beast. They're dreaming about the beast we saw in verse 9. And the dogs are greedy and they're not satisfied. And they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to their own unjust gain, uh, to the last one. They say, come, let us get wine and let us drink heavily of strong drink. Tomorrow will be like today, only more so. In other words, they say, hey, the, the coming of the Lord, what are you guys talking about, man? Let's go out, let's party, let's get down, man. Let's, let, you know, let's feel good, let's toss back a few, you know. And they say, come, let us get wine, let us drink heavily of strong drink. Tomorrow will only be like today. And that's why they're the ones that, they're kind of dreaming, they're kind of lying down, they love to slumber. They're kind of blind, you know, as, as they think that they're watchmen, but they're blind. They're kind of dumb because, because they cannot even bark, saying that, hey, there's somebody coming to attack your house. There's somebody coming to turn things around. Uh, each has turned to their own way. Each one to his unjust gain, guys. I love the, the verse uh, 4, chapter 4, guys. Uh, uh, those that hold fast to my covenant. Those that hold fast to my covenant. Again, it speaks of to be or to grow firm or strong or strengthen. It speaks of those who have recovered, those who have overcome, those who have prevailed from the sins of the world and the things that hold us back, guys. It says uh, that we might grow firm or strong or to be strengthened, that we would be courageous. Where does our courage come from? Not from us, guys. Our courage comes from the Lord. Where does our power come from? Our power comes from the, the moving of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. Those who are caught fast, it's kind of like, it's kind of like those who, whose heads are like flint, and we become hard-headed, that hey, nothing is going to turn us from the love of Jesus Christ. Nothing is going to turn us away 
from walking that walk with him and following after him. We are held fast in his love. We are held fast in the palm of his hands. We have collected strength in him. He has become our encourager. He has established, established us in his security. We have become fortified. We have gained ascendancy, a position of domination. See, I can't even read my own word over there. That's pretty bad. <laughs> but I, I know that a position of domination, we have gained ascendancy over the things of this world, over the things of the flesh, over the things of, the, uh, of what the enemy puts out in front of us, guys. We have be become overcomers in him. Uh, we can be, be overcome by the things of the world. We can be overcome by the things of the world. We can be overcome by the desires of the flesh. We, we can be overcomers in Christ Jesus. As Jesus wrote to the churches in the book of Revelation, he called them to be overcomers in Christ, overcomers in him, overcomers uh, from all the things that the church would face in the world. It's a good time for us to maybe go back and look at the book of Revelation and to see hey, what God has called us to be overcomers uh, again uh, in Christ Jesus. Why don't we pray?